We're going. Okay. Hello. So thank you for joining me. Uh, we're here at Studio 67 in Oshawa, which is 67 Simcoe Street North. I'm Tim Packer. I'm having a solo show right here. And tonight I'm giving a talk about social media and how we can use social media to improve our business, grow our business, reach more fans, all of that kind of stuff. So we're also broadcasting live to Facebook. So hello out there, Facebook. Um, I will be doing this talk. The talk's probably going to be around a half an hour, um, and I'm going to be taking questions. So for those of you watching on Facebook, uh, you can type in your questions, and we'll get to those later. So the first thing I want to I want to talk about, just to get a sense from the the people that are here, how many of you here are on social media right now? Okay, so pretty much everybody, right? How many of you said five years ago you would never be on Facebook, never be on Instagram? <laughs> pretty much all of us. Uh, and that's kind of the main point about social media today. It was a thing for young kids. Uh, and I, a year and a half ago, I thought social media was all about giggling babies and cat videos. Uh, and I was doing it only because my son Cameron said I should be doing it. Uh, but I had no idea what I was doing and it actually had pretty much zero impact on my business. And then about two years ago, I, I decided, I, I, I've experienced success way beyond my wildest dreams. Um, so my dream when I was a kid was to be an artist um, and to just make, you know, a half decent living. Um, that was the dream from when I was very little. I studied commercial art in high school. I studied graphic design in college. I was a starving designer for two years. I didn't like that, so I joined the Toronto Police Service. And I did that for 18 years. And then I continued to paint as a hobby until it got more and more serious to where I actually quit my job, cashed in my pension at the end of 1999, and started painting full time. Uh, and it took about five years for me really to get some traction. Uh, but since then, and since this current style that I'm doing has evolved, my career has just gone way beyond what I ever dreamed um, would be possible. And so my first in introduction to social media was about two years ago. I was at the opening of a, a show that I was having in a Toronto gallery down in Yorkville. And this was like the movie version of a gallery opening. This was, you know, red, red carpet out front, red velvet ropes, people lined up to come in, a doorman checking off names, waiters walking around with trays of wine, someone playing live music, red dots going up all over the room. Uh, and I just realized that this is it. This is, this is the dream. Like, I've, this was the dream, and I've made it. Uh, and almost immediately, I had enough, rather than just feeling elated, I had this other feeling, which was almost like guilt, um, because I realized I know all kinds of people who share that same dream and who shared that same dream and who still haven't, haven't had the opportunity to achieve it. And I know so there's so many young people out there who have that dream and they get it beat out of them because everyone tells them you can't make a living as an artist. It's impossible to make a living as an artist. And they believe that. Well, I'm here to tell you, you can make a great living as an artist. Um, and at that moment, I realized that what I wanted to do was pay it forward. Um, I realized that my success didn't happen just by accident. There was a lot of things that I did, both in terms of uh, improving my, my skill level, my theoretical knowledge, uh, and then being involved in creativity to create my own unique voice. And that's what led to my success. And so my goal then, I thought, I'm going to share everything that I've learned about art in my entire life, and I'm going to put it all up on YouTube for free. And that's my kind of investment in karma. Because I'm, I also, when I get them about you, but when I start, things start going too good, I start to get a little worried, right? Like, okay, is this wave going to crash? So that was me hedging my bets. It's like, for the universe, I'm going to put this all up for free. I'm not going to monetize it. And so I started, I went down to Vistec in Toronto. I invested in $25,000 in camera and video equipment. And we started doing these videos. And I did these videos that were fabulous according to the response that we got from people. We got great feedback. The problem is they were only being seen by 20 people, 30 people, because it's so hard to cut through the noise of social media, and YouTube is social media. And, and so I was getting so discouraged, so discouraged, so discouraged, and then I discovered a guy by the name of Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, and this, or Gary V. If you just Google Gary V, V-E-E, -E, you will get this, get, get tons on this guy. Um, I just have to warn you, he's, he has what he uses, what he calls salty language. So he drops F-bombs and all that. If that's going to offend you, don't watch him. But he has changed my life, literally. 
So I saw a video uh, of him on, on YouTube. He was talking about social media and how social media can and should be used um, as a marketing tool. And my wife and I were leaving for a trip to Utah to go skiing. And so I saw this video the night before and I thought, I gotta get his book. And I actually, I got all of his books. Um, he's got five New York Times bestsellers. He runs a hundred million dollar uh, digital ad agency. They've got 800 employees around the world. His goal is to buy the New York Jets, which is a multi-billion dollar proposition, and he's probably gonna do it. So anyways, I, I was watching his videos, I was reading his books, and as I said, I'd been on social media. I was on Instagram for about a year. My son Cameron works for me full time now and has for two years, and he got me on Instagram. He said, I gotta do Instagram. And I said to him, okay, we can go on Instagram, you can come in and take photos of me, we'll post them on my site, but don't bother me with people's comments. I don't have time for that, I'm too busy. If someone wants to buy a painting, you can come and talk to me, but otherwise, I don't wanna hear about it. Just take the photos, put them up there. And so I'm reading this book, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, and he actually says that people say that to him all the time. Gary, I don't have time to be answering comments to people, I'm a busy guy, and I just don't have time for this. And his response was, you mean to tell me Somebody's taken time out of their day to actually write you a note, to tell you how much they love what you do or how much they appreciate what you do, to thank you for sharing what you do, and you don't have time to say thank you, you arrogant, you know what. And I'm reading this book in the plane, and I realize, oh my God, this is me. I, this is exactly what I have an, I, I didn't even know how to access my Instagram account. So I read this in the book and I thought, okay, I'm gonna change because I know I, and the reason I wanted to get proficient in social media is I wanted to be able to direct people to my YouTube channel because I want that to be my legacy of sharing all that information I have. So while we were there in Park City, Utah, I called home, I got Cameron to tell me how to actually access Instagram on my phone, which is the first time I'd ever actually used an app on my phone. I only had my phone for emergency purposes. I didn't use it for any of this stuff. So I found out how to go in on Instagram and I started looking at all these comments and it broke my heart. Like I had, there were people who had like five paragraphs of how much they love what I do and how much it brings them peace and how much, you know, just it means and please keep posting. And there was just like comment after comment after comment. And for a year, these people had gotten nothing back from me. So that, that week in, in Park City, Utah, I spent probably two or three hours a day going back through an entire year's worth of Instagram comments and answering everybody. And then the other time I was spent watching Gary Vaynerchuk's videos. Now when I left to go to Park City, Utah, I had about 100 followers on Instagram. And here's where, I, I'm a big believer in kind of karma, and just like the, the world gives you signposts about when you're doing the right thing. While I was in Park City, Utah, answering all these comments, one of my posts of me with one of my paintings got posted on a big art site, Art Fido, and then it then got posted on Art of the World, and it got like 100,000 likes, and I picked up 1,000 Instagram followers overnight. So again, to me, it's like the world was speaking to me. This is what you need to be doing. So I came back from my trip, and I just kind of threw myself into all this stuff. I also emailed Gary Vaynerchuk. So Gary Vaynerchuk, at the end of all his books, he says, if, uh, let me know what you think of this and how, how, how it affected you. So I emailed him on Sunday afternoon to say, Gary, I just read your books and I watched a bunch of your videos. I know it's gonna change my life. I just wanna say thank you. Anyways, he responds back to me that afternoon. Tim, I'm so happy you know, that, 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 that this has affected you like this and keep me apprised. So I was just thrilled. So I threw myself into watching all of his videos and reading all of his stuff and putting it into action. And so there's a few things about social media that I didn't understand that I understand now. So social media, basically social media is just the current state of the internet. Almost everything that we use on the internet now is in fact social media one way or another. The biggest ones of course, and more, more probably common to us, are Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Uh, then you also have Snapchat, Musical.ly, after school, there's just so much of it. But over 50% of people's time that they spend on the internet, they spend on one form of social media or another. That's where they're watching. And that's really important because before you can tell somebody how great your product is, your service is, whatever it is you're trying to sell them, you have to first of all get their attention. And that's where their attention is now. Their attention is on social media. We're going through probably the biggest shift in communications since television came along 
and basically destroyed radio. It didn't destroy radio, it destroyed those advertisers who did not move to TV, who, who kind of poo-pooed the eye of TV as it was going to be a fad, and they stuck with their tried and true. There was a number of beer um, um, distillers that went out of business when the switch from radio to TV because they didn't move to TV, and that's where all the attention went. So now the attention is on social media. But social media is not like typical transactional marketing that we've experienced for years. The typical marketing was, you know, we have, a, we have an ad, and then we want return on investment on that ad. And we want it to happen very quickly, and we want to be able to measure it. Um, and so that's why when a lot of people try social media, they're not, they're not happy with it because they say, well, we, we did 10 ads, and nothing happened. Social media is not about that. Social media is about creating a community. It's about creating relationships with people. And it's about lifetime value of your client. Uh, when you are doing social media, this is a long play. You're not, you're not trying to get someone who follows you today to buy your product today. You're get, you want them to be buying your product 10 years from now and having them buy their kids your product for their wedding presents. So how do we do that? Well, with social media, it's all about giving. So the book that I read from Gary Vaynerchuk, it was called Jab, 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 Right Hook. What it actually means is give, 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 ask. So social media is all about giving away value with zero expectation uh, of anything in return. Just knowing that over time, people that follow you, that appreciate what you do, they will in fact in time become clients. But it's not quantifiable. It's not like in transactional marketing where you do the ad now or you do the post now and you get the money coming in now. So I realized this. And so I started posting on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, and just giving away all. So first of all, I did a number of videos about giving away the information that I have, whether it be various techniques, various things about marketing, various things about dealing with galleries, and also just posting what I was painting. So how many people in here are creatives? How many people either paint, whatever? So a good portion of it. So we got it lucky. So because the best thing about being a creative is your fallback on any given day is just document. Don't create. It's like if you're in the studio painting every day, you know, some days I'll do a very creative post, some days I'll do a video, but some days, if any of you have been following my feed here from the week, from the week, it's like at the very least, at the end of the day, my son comes in or my wife comes in and they take a picture of me with what I've done that day. And then the post is, here's, here's what I'm working on today. Uh, and, and so it's so easy. For other people, they have to create content. Creating content is really, really hard. But just documenting is so, so easy and people find it fascinating. And there's some very creative ways to document too. So we do a lot of, um, Time-lapse videos where we'll just set, especially if I'm working on a big piece, we'll set the camera up, have it shoot every 10 seconds, and then it shoots a little time-lapse video. And then we put that to music, we put some commentary on it, we put it up there, people love watching it, and I'm not asking for anything. 99% of the time, all I'm doing is saying, here's what I've done today, or here's my latest painting, or here's these brushes that I use to do this, or here's, here's why I paint on a red canvas, or do something about composition. And that's the jab, jab, jab. That's the give, give, give. Um, but the other part of it is there is a right hook. So when you do, so for me, any of you have been following my post this week, you'll also see almost every post, it ends with, I'm currently at my show at 97 Simcoe Street North. 20% off this weekend, you can, uh, you can access it via the internet, use the coupon code open house. So when you right hook people, you let them know you're right hooking. You, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. But the idea is to, first of all, you've created a following who love your work. Um, the other thing, as Gary Vaynerchuk says, you want to give away so much stuff that you guilt people into feeling, you know what, we should at least buy a print, right? And I've actually seen that happen here over the course of the week where I've had people come in, talk to me, and they've kind of said right off the bat, well, we're not really in the market to buy, but they're just interested. And I'll sit and talk with them for an hour and a half, and they'll go away and talk, and they'll come back, and they'll say, okay, we're going to take a small print, right? That's why when you go to Costco, they have people giving away samples because there's that feeling that it's a human emotion of reciprocity. Someone gives you something, you feel like you should give back. And so that's the whole idea of social media, is you give people value. Um, and if you give them value, two things will happen. They will keep coming back and watching you. So your, your viewership will expand, but then also they will feel at a certain point, we should probably buy something. Even if, even if it's not 
ideally you want them to buy it because they just absolutely love your stuff, right? But anything that we can do to encourage people to buy is good. So that giving away is very, very, very important. And there's three things if we are going to do social media that you need to do to create value. It can be any one of these three or ideally all three of these three. So it can be entertaining, it can be inspiring, or it can be educational. If you can do any of those three things, people will watch your videos. So that's the giggling babies and the cat videos, right? It's just entertaining, you know? It's the little dachshund that's trying to leap up on the couch and finally makes it. That's entertaining and inspiring, right? Um, it's if I do a, a three minute time lapse of me creating a four foot by six foot painting, it's entertaining, it's also inspiring to see that happen like that. And if I'm giving a commentary where I'm explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing, it's also educational. So if you can get all three into a post, you will get people liking it more. And that's where we get into engagement. So the whole idea is, first of all, you want to put content out there in social media that has value because you want it to reach as many people as possible. And the way, I'm just going to deal with Facebook here because I know that one the best, but they all kind of work the same way. So if you have a Facebook account, when you go to your Facebook feed, there's potentially millions of posts out there struggling to get into your feed. And Facebook wants to give you, those the first 10 posts that you get are the top 10 that Facebook thinks you are going to like more than anything else that's out there. And they do that by what's called edge ranking. And so that has to do with, first of all, it goes to things you've liked before, people you follow. If you follow me and you like my posts and you comment on my posts, then there's a good chance I'm going to show up in your feed. But just in any person's feed, Facebook, if I, I have right now like 18,000 followers on Facebook, well, they don't all get every one of my posts. Facebook only lets a certain percentage of them get your post. And then they wait and see what happens. And every time someone engages with the post, the Facebook analytics rate that post as being more worthy of being shared out with other people's feeds. So engagement is likes. When someone likes your post, that increases, that increases the engagement. When someone shares your post, Facebook loves it when people share your post. Um, when people comment on your post, and most importantly, when you comment back and when there's a dialogue which is why it's so important to answer every single comment. Aside from just the moral kind of prerogative, if someone takes time out of their day to tell you how much they love what you're doing, it's just the right thing to do. Because, because etiquette on Facebook or Instagram or anything else is just like etiquette in the real world. If someone says, I love your work, you say thank you, right? You don't just walk away and ignore them, which is what I did for a year on Instagram. So when you do, if you create a post and all of this stuff is happening, being shared, it's being liked, people are commenting, you're commenting back, it's edge ranking goes up, it goes out to more people. As they share more posts, as they share your posts with their group and all of that happens, that's how a post goes viral. So, and what determines, who determines what content goes viral? The public. We don't, all you can do is put out your posts and try to create posts that have value for people. And so this is what I learned. And so I started doing this in Facebook, I started doing this in Instagram, but I really wanted to get on LinkedIn. I was on LinkedIn, we'd done one post, it did nothing, um, but I read an article that said the average LinkedIn user makes $100,000 a year. Like, that's my people, right? That's better than the average Instagram user who's 18 or 22 years old. So I thought we need to be on LinkedIn. So Cameron and I, we both took an online course on LinkedIn and how to use LinkedIn. And that's like, you got anything? He's like, nope. I said, me neither. All of this stuff we read about, about using LinkedIn, um, and it was all about job search. It was all about um, em employment, um, and it was all B2B stuff. And we said, you know what? And, and so that's one of the other things from, from Gary Vaynerchuk that's really important, because people are always asking him, Gary, what should I do? What should I do? It's like, well, you have to try. Because this stuff is so new and it's changing all the time, just try. Try. See what works. Be a practitioner. So we said, you know what, we're just going to do what we do on our other stuff. We'll document. So the very first post that we did next, I just finished a big four by seven painting, Shall We Dance? Um, and I was sitting beside the painting and uh, took a picture of me beside the painting, posted it on LinkedIn, and I said, this is my latest painting at four by seven. It's one of the biggest paintings I've ever created. That's it. Uh, later that night, something funny started happening. I started getting all these comments and likes on LinkedIn. 
And so it's like, I'm answering every single comment. And it's like, holy geez, by the end of the night, I've got like 100, 100 likes and 20 comments. And it's like, this is crazy. This went on for the next day, next day, next day. By a weekend, I was spending four hours a day answering comments on LinkedIn. I was getting messages from LinkedIn telling me that they detected suspicious activity on my account. And if I was using bots or scrapers or any illegal software to drive the engagement, I should stop it because that, that would be grounds for them to suspend my account. So I just, I just messaged back. I'm just saying thank you to the people who are complimenting my work. And the first level response I got uh, from the, from the um, compliance person was, well, that sounds reasonable. I'm going to pass this upstairs. So it got passed upstairs, got passed upstairs. Um, and, and at this point, I think I was at about 40, 40 50,000 likes, maybe four or 5,000 comments, um, picking up. So LinkedIn, um, people ask you for a link request if they want to link with you. I was picking up five, 600 link requests a day which I was saying yes to because that's, um, because in LinkedIn you can direct message anybody who's a LinkedIn um, link. So about, about a week in, I'm about 40, 50,000 uh, likes. Um, and then LinkedIn finally gets back and I've gone up to the highest level in their compliance and they say, if this continues, we will suspend your account indefinitely. Um, and by this point too, I'd already upgraded to LinkedIn Premium because I thought if they suspend my account, because LinkedIn is free, Right? I don't have a leg to stand on. But if I'm paying 500 bucks a year for the premium product, I have, I have a leg to stand on and I can't expect certain things here. So they, they sent me the message that said, if this continues, we will suspend your account. And my, my immediate reaction was, thank you LinkedIn, and I need to find a publicist. Because uh, now we're gonna go traditional media. So I found a publicist, a uh, small boutique agency in Toronto, Duet. Um, and I called them up and I explained the story. Basically, linked, I have a, this is great. I have a post that's gone viral on LinkedIn. I'm getting all this exposure. And LinkedIn is threatening to suspend my account for saying thank you to people. So they said, yes, this is great. Let's run with it. So I was on Global's uh, morning show with the painting uh, in front of an audience of 3 million people. and got about a 15-minute bit being interviewed on, on Global's morning show. I was on 1010 Talk Radio. Uh, I was on Chex TV. Uh, checked that painting was actually the feature piece in a solo show I was having that was opening at Gallery on the Lake. So Chex TV was there at the opening to interview me about the painting that caused all the stir. Um, it was covered in about 10 different uh, digital print newspapers, so an online kind of print. Um, and by the end of the whole thing, I had over 110,000 likes. I had, there was over 12,000 comments. I actually did stop responding to all of the comments because I didn't want to get suspended um, until I finally got a call from someone way high up in LinkedIn Canada, a personal call, who said, oh, I'd like to speak to Tim. And it's like, hi, it's, I'm pretty sure it was the head of LinkedIn Canada, uh, but very high up that said, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your success with this and I want to say I'm so sorry about what's happening. Uh, because I knew, I did a video, LinkedIn is threatening to shut me down because I'm saying thank you. Um, and I knew that at a certain point, someone high up enough in LinkedIn would see this story, right? And realize, and I think their initial reaction was, oh, this artist has got this post that's going, it's like, oh, this is, oh no, this is not good, right? Because we threatened to suspend his account. So um, all of this is going on, and then I have the show opens at Gallery on the Lake. And in the first hour of the painting, so that at that point was the most expensive painting I'd ever created. It was a $17,000 painting. The painting sold in the first hour of the show. Second hour of the show, we had a call from uh, someone who, from LinkedIn, from England, who wanted to buy the painting. Told him, unfortunately, it's gone. He commissioned another $17,000 painting off of me. Uh, that was the most successful show uh, Esther at Gallery on the Lake had ever had with a living artist. And then we were just in the process of opening our Shopify store too. So that's our online store where we're actually selling our Gclay products. And we thought, okay, we gotta cash in on this now, like this, the hype of this, of this print. So I did a couple of videos and a couple of posts saying, we're gonna be releasing um, a limited edition prints of this in three different sizes, but we are gonna do a pre-release uh, opportunity for people who follow my newsletter, where they are gonna get a 20% discount and they will also have access to that. We were gonna do 25 hand embellished G clays. The first 25 were gonna be hand embellished. 
Um, but anyone from my newsletter would be given a special access to buy this before we release it to the public. So we did that. We did 20,000 in online sales in a 10-day period uh, directly from our website, all through social media. So giggling babies and cat videos, no, like that, if I hadn't already been kind of convinced of that, that social media is kind of, it is the most important thing right now. Uh, if you are in business, you need to first and foremost consider yourself a media company about promoting you and your business and your brand and then whatever business you were in. So that was my, that all happened to me. This was in March that I kind of, you know, drank the Kool-Aid and said, I'm in. Uh, and this happened in August. So very quickly that happened for me. And then I just decided, you know what, I'm just gonna keep going all in on this. Um, and more and more involved in Facebook, more involved uh, in Instagram. Uh, and at that point as well, I decided as part of that whole thing of giving back, um, I was gonna mentor a young artist. So there's a young artist by the name of Brooke Cormier, who I got to know through her parents. She just graduated from university um, as a landscape architect last year. So she's been out, out of school for just over a year. Um, and then she got to know me through her parents and I got to know her and she's very talented and so she broke the news to her parents. Thank you very much for that wonderful education. Uh, but I want to pursue art as a career. And so they talked to me about it and I said, yes, I think she should go ahead and do it. She's extremely talented. She's got an incredible work ethic. She's got a great head on her shoulders for business. So she started doing, I said, I will mentor her, but I will only mentor her on the condition that we videotape all of our sessions and we put them up on our YouTube channel so that everybody can benefit from what I'm talking to her about. So Brooke at that point, she had, she had an Instagram account, she had like 100 followers on it. Um, and so I, again, I, we had to talk about social media. She, she, she created her own website, she created her own Facebook, she created her own YouTube channel. She started going really all in on Instagram and she's been working her butt off. So I just talked to her today. So uh, this is her first full year as a full-time artist. Um, so most of you know, if you, charge, if you, if you earn over $30,000 a year, you have to charge HST. She's charging HST. She's over $30,000 in earnings already in her first year. She's not in any galleries. She's only done three, she's done one show. She was in the Oshawa Art Association show and she's done like three weekend festivals. Almost all of her traffic is coming from Instagram. And a little bugger, so she had, she had 200 Instagram followers when we started this, I had like 3,400. She's at 38,000 right now. Every post that she does gets like 1,000 likes and gets people clamoring for the right to buy her work. Um, and she's just, again, I don't know where she's going, but she, it took me five years of working full time and working my butt off to hit that $30,000 mark and she's done it in one year. Uh, and it's all because of, so first of all, it's all because she's incredibly talented and she's working hard. But if it wasn't for social media, she'd have a pile of paintings piling up at her house and she'd be going around hat in hand to galleries saying, would you please consider showing my work? She's beating them off with a stick. And we've already decided, like she does not even need to consider galleries for another four or five years, if at all. Only if her prices get to the point where the, like, the internet won't bear it. And I don't know if that'll ever happen because people are getting so comfortable in buying paintings. I had two originals from this show were going down to New York where the person just ordered from the website, saw them on the website, he's a LinkedIn connection, saw, saw that I was having the show, went to the website, picked two paintings and said, can you ship them to me to New York? Um, so it's just, just incredible. Um, and so I'm gonna talk to you about um, Facebook and how you can use Facebook, because that's the thing that we, we use the most. For me, Facebook is probably, Facebook and LinkedIn is where I get the majority of things that actually lead to business. And in Facebook, so you do your regular posts, it's free, it's free to post. Um, but there's a thing called a boost, so that you can, there's ad products on Facebook. The only thing that I use really is, is the boost. Because for me right now, when you're, when you're advertising on any of this stuff, there's, there's transactional advertising and then there's brand building. Um, and brand building is all just about awareness, about creating relationships, about creating people who love you and your work that you know are going to be clients at one time down the road. And so that's what I'm focused on. Um, and so we boost our posts. We've done a couple ads, but I don't, I don't like that. They cost a lot more. 
Um, but so the whole idea of boosting a post is say an average post without boosting um, would reach 5,000 people if it got a lot of interaction. If you boost that post, Facebook opens up the funnel a little bit more. Because Mark Zuckerberg's not stupid, right? He's not doing Facebook so all of us can have these wonderful lives and careers. He's doing it to make money. And there was a time about a year ago where I would get 30, 40, 50,000 uh, views on a good post, just a native post. Those days are gone. If you want to have that kind of exposure, you need to boost a post. And you can boost a post for $5. Even boosting a post for $5 could potentially five times or 10 times um, the amount of people to see it. But when you boost the post, you can be so very specific. So I've been boosting anything I've done boosting here about the show, be, leading up to the show, all of my boosts, you go into your demographics and it's like, okay, well, you can have, if, if you have a product that's just for ladies, it'll only go to ladies, you just choose women. If it's a men's product, you go to men. Uh, so I've been boosting to men and women, 25 to 65 plus, because typically people under 25 aren't, I don't want my stuff going to 18 year olds and 12 year olds, because they're not likely gonna buy. Um, so initially I was boosting to Toronto and Whitby and Oshawa, so the whole kind of Eastern GTA. Uh, and then you can go in and say, I want people who are interested in art and contemporary art, art collectors, so that those boosted posts, that you're, those boosted views, they're going to people who specifically are interested in what you're doing. And then you can create an event. So I created an event for the show. The, the show here, you can create the dates that it's on, uh, the interest that, that you want to target it to, and how much you want to spend on it. And that will show up in people's feeds if there's an event going on near you. Um, and so I've been doing this all week long. Um, and as we've got down to certain things, some of the days now I'm just boosting to Oshawa because we're getting into the last couple days. So it's like, or I'm, when I boosted about this painting I'm going to be working on, come in and see me in the gallery. Well, I don't really want that going to somebody who lives out in Mississauga, right? So I say, well, I'm just going to boost it to Oshawa. And so you can target who's going to get your posts. Um, and we've done, so, so far I've been here for seven, today's Tuesday, seventh day. We've done about 27,000 in sales here. Um, almost everybody, we've had two walk-ins that just happened to walk in the door. Every single other person that came in here, that's like, hi, I follow you on Facebook, I follow you on YouTube, I saw your LinkedIn post, whatever. And this is, for artists, the greatest thing since sliced bread. Because before, we were beholden to the gatekeepers, which for us was the gallery owners, right? They controlled access to the clients, and they controlled the client list. Now the gatekeepers are gone. Now we have access to them. And this type of thing, I think you're gonna see more and more and more, um, because we don't need to be in a gallery 365 days a year, right? We need every, every six weeks, eight weeks, whatever, have a space for a week and have a show. The problem has always been getting the bums in the seats to see your work, right? Getting people in there. With social media, now you can reach a huge audience you can tell them where you are and where your work is and your fans can come and see you. And then we're gonna close up tomorrow, so it'll be a day to set up, eight days here, a day to take down, 10 days later, $27,000, thank you very much. I'll be back in my studio painting, and then we're doing a pop-up in Toronto for the month of December. And the same thing, we'll be, and I will be boosting a lot of the stuff leading up to the show to the GTA, because I wanna increase my audience there, I want them to know this is, this is coming up. So that's, kind of in a nutshell, the whole idea of social media and why it is so important to us now. Um, it is, oh, one more thing I should say, the, if you're gonna advertise, traditional media still works, right? Television commercials still get seen, although companies are spending billions of dollars a year, and I guarantee every single person in this room fast forwards through every single television commercial, every chance they get, and again, to steal a line from Gary Vaynerchuk, if, if by chance the remote has fallen off the bed so you can't fast forward it, as soon as a commercial comes on, you grab your phone and you're checking your emails, you're checking your Instagram, you're checking your Facebook. So the whole idea of traditional media is that it's way overpriced. This is way underpriced because big Fortune 500 companies are not here yet. Uh, it's just like with Google AdWords. When Google AdWords came out, you could buy the word wine for five cents a click. Now it's nine dollars a click, right? You can get a lot of exposure now on social media. But when those companies bring their billions of dollars into Facebook, Instagram, all of this other stuff, 
It's not going to be a $10 boost to get an extra thousand people. It's going to be a $500 boost. So the time is really right to move into social media um, and start taking advantage of that. The whole idea is this is, if this is TV in the 1980s, you want to be Seinfeld. You want to be MASH. You want to be, you want to be the thing people are watching. And the cost of entry is almost zero. I mentioned that we, when I went out and purchased all of this equipment, we used that for a little while. I shoot almost everything on my iPhone because it's just so easy. The quality is so good. The only piece of extra equipment we have is a lavalier mic that plugs into the iPhone. It's a $100 Rode mic. That gives us as good sound quality as the $500 Rode Boom mic that I have. Uh, so just with a tripod, your iPhone, and, and the mic, you're off ready to go. You can start creating your own content, your own show, and grow your own audience. So that's kind of it for my basic talk. And I'd be happy now to take questions, if there's questions from Facebook or questions from you here. Yes? That's a great question because I actually, and I had, to, I had to fight with that the whole issue because I had something horrible happen. Three years ago, I got a email from Sterling Edwards, who I think some of you know, he's a very famous artist from the States who teaches a lot of workshops, good friend of mine, and he emailed me and said, Tim, I think you might want to check this out. I think this guy's copying your work. Uh, and so he sends me an image and it's like, yes, that's a copy of my painting and it's on eBay for sale. Uh, and it's a crude copy of my work. Uh, not of my style, but of a specific painting. I go to this guy's website, he's got over a hundred copies of my paintings he has on his website, and he's starting to produce prints of his paintings that are copies of my work. Again, not of my style, but it's like, that's a copy of that piece, that's a copy of that piece, that's a copy of that piece. Uh, so after feeling almost like wanting to throw up, and this was right before Christmas too, so I thought, I just can't deal with this now, I'm just gonna put it out of my head and the New Year's I'll deal with it. So first of all, this guy, you couldn't be more stupid in terms of choosing who you are going to infringe copyright on. I was a detective in the commercial crime unit of the Toronto Fraud Squad, right? <laughs> it's like, have you read my bio? Like, and he lived in Uxbridge. When I saw it, it was an Eastern European name, I thought, if this guy's like in Bulgaria, there's nothing I can do. He lived in Uxbridge. So it's like, well, it's going to rain hard on you. So I first of all called the RCMP, called the OPP, commercial crime units, because it's a criminal offense to copy someone's work. But their response was basically, unless it's endangering the health and welfare of Canadian citizens, we don't have the time to, to pursue it. You'll have to go through the civil route. So they gave me the name of the top uh, intellectual property firm in Toronto. I called them up, explained the situation, sent them just a couple images, uh, and they said, okay, yeah, we'll take it. We're gonna need a $1,000 retainer, and we'll get the rest of the money off him. Uh, because there's an irrebuttable presumption in law in Canada, if you can prove that they have infringed on your copyright, they must pay your legal bills at an absolute minimum. So anyways, we went through the whole thing. It was, it was very stressful for me. I had to document all of these paintings and, and, and it was almost like points of comparison, like a fingerprint analysis. Um, over 100, 100 paintings. We settled out of court um, with the settlement being, first of all, that he, he admitted that he'd copied my work. He admitted that the compensatory, so there's two types of damages when you sue. There's compensatory and punitive. Uh, the punitive is to punish someone. The compensatory is just how much that impacted me. And they agreed on $5,000 per painting at 100 paintings. Uh, and, we, and I said, I am not gonna go after the compensatory damages. I just want, he needs to admit it. He needs to destroy all, those, all of the works. And we will hold that kind of in abeyance. And if he ever infringes on my work again, he's got a half million dollar suit hanging over his head that he's already agreed he, he's guilty of. Um, and so my legal bills were $25,000. His were about $15,000, so it cost him 40 grand. So the message was there. And I love telling this story because just like anybody who's out there looking, it, it's like, it, I, I want to be known like Disney. Like when I was a fraud investigator, Disney was known that if you copied a Mickey Mouse drawing, they'd fly 10 people to China, put them up in a hotel for a month to prosecute the case. Prosecute the case. But then that gets to, okay, you're right. When I'm on, I'm on YouTube now, I'm showing people how I paint, right? I'm showing them my technique, I'm showing all that. So I put out there every opportunity I get that if you infringe on my copyright, I will sue you. 
Um, but then the question becomes, well, what about people copying your style, right? And I, I, my initial reaction was I don't want that. But then I thought, how many impressionist painters are out there in the world right now because of Paul Monet, right? And Manet and, and Pizarro and all of those. It's like, if at the end of me doing all of this, hundreds or thousands of people 20 years from now are painting in a style similar to mine and I, I'm seen as the founder of that style, I'll take it. That's pretty good. That's probably just gonna make the, the value of Tim go up, right? So that's how I came up across that kind of, um, dealt with that dilemma. It's like if it happens, it happens. If somebody copies my work, I'll deal with it, then I'll sue them. Right? If they copy my style, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. I actually have on my YouTube channel, I have people sending me, and I actually encourage them. It's like don't, because copying is also a very valid form of learning, right? So copying is allowed as long as it's not for a commercial purpose. So it, that's why you have copy of students going into the Louvre and copying the old masters. So if it's just being done as a learning experience, it comes under what's called fair usage. But if you take that painting and then enter it in a jury show or you put it up for sale, now you're breaching the copyright. Um, but copying someone's style, one of the first, um, first exercises I gave Brooke when I started mentoring her is I picked six artists who were radically different because she was really tied up in this really tight realism. So I picked six different artists, Van Gogh was one of them, Brian Rutenberg was another, and I said, I want you to choose subject matter totally different than what they paint, but I want you to try to paint it in their style, and I don't want you to investigate how they do it. I just want you to try to think, how would you do that? And that's a really, really great learning exercise. Um, and then I have a number of my students that they're, so when I, I gave my talk on copyright and a bunch of them were like, well, I was gonna paint my backyard in your style, but now I'm not. And I was like, no, you, you can paint anything you want copying my style, you just can't copy my painting. And so they're actually now sending me images of stuff where they're painting their scenes in my style. And it's like, I'm cool with that, right? So, yep. That I can't help you with. That's like asking me, how can I make a good part-time living as a professional golfer? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, it, it is one of those things, if, if you are an artist and you're trying to make money off things that people pay money, so people pay to paint and it's a hobby and they give their stuff away. So if you want to sell your work, um, it's, it's really tough to develop a name, to develop a following, and all of that when you're only producing six paintings a year, 10 paintings a year, whatever. Again, it's like trying to make a living, as a, it's like me saying, how can I make a living as a pretty good men's league hockey player? You can't, at least as an artist, we, have the, we, we do have the added benefit that you can make 500, 1,000, 2,000 dollars, you go to Camp Samac, you go in these group shows here. Anybody else who has one of those hobbies that they'd love to turn into a profession, they don't have the opportunity to do that. But in terms of the social media, um, so that's, I should have started the talk with this, is this is, this talk is all about, it's like assuming you want to increase your audience, you want to increase your sales, um, you want to increase the kind of reach of your work. If you're good, if you're good with where you are now, you don't need to do any of this stuff. I mean, part of me, part of me kind of looks back on the days, you know, four years ago when all I was doing was selling in galleries, and I would paint four or five hours a day and the rest of my time was my own, right? Now I'm up at seven o'clock, I'm spending an hour and a half answering comments on Instagram. I just did a vlog earlier this summer uh, for 90, for four months where I, well the first month I did, I did a video every single day, 10 to 20 minute video every single day. And then that was too much, for, and that was to grow my YouTube channel. Because this whole thing started because I wanted to grow my YouTube channel. And all of this other stuff was happening. All of these direct, uh, direct sales from clients were coming in, but my YouTube channel was still kind of lagging with like 150, 200 followers. And I saw a post on, on there at Gary Vaynerchuk where they were saying, if you really want to grow your YouTube channel, you have to do a vlog and you have to post every day. It's like, okay, I guess let's try that. So I did a video a day for a month. That grew up to about 500 followers. And then that was too much. I had to cut back uh, and I just did Monday to Friday for another three months. So 
So I have 90, I think 94 daily art blogs up there and we got over a thousand, I think we're about 1100. And then I just said, okay. Like, so every, every night going to bed, thinking about what am I gonna shoot tomorrow? Getting up in the morning, spending 20, 25 minutes to shoot the video, spending a half an hour, 40 minutes or an hour to edit the video um, and then post the video and then answering all the comments there. Um, but it did the job. It got my YouTube channel up over a thousand people and they say for YouTube that's kind of the, um, the tipping point. Once you get over a thousand uh, followers, then it can start really snowballing. So I did that and now I'm back to one video a week, uh, partly because you know, I was just getting burned out but also partly because, you know, it's like I'm running out of stuff to say, right? I don't just want to be up there blathering. So it's like once a week I can put together really good content. And so that's, that's what I'm doing now. G-A-R-Y, so Gary. And then it's V-A-Y-N-E-R-C-H-U-K. And there are literally, there's over 500 hours of videos of him out there. He actually has a... He has, he has a blog called The Daily V, and he has a film team that follows him around all day long, every day, filming everything he does, and then they condense that down to a five or 10 minute uh, video. Uh, he, he, I actually got to see him uh, when he spoke at the Haste and Hustle Conference in Niagara-on-the-Lake, and I actually got to meet him, because um, they had a contest uh, if you, to do a one minute video of why you are an elite hustler. And if you, if you do that, then, if, if you were one of the top 10, you got to go to the VIP thing, you got to meet the stars backstage, and I wanted to meet Gary, so I did. And my, why I was an elite hustler was that whole thing. I took my, my uh, social media following from several hundred to, at that point, I think it was 20,000. I was featured in Gary Vaynerchuk's newsletter. I actually had one of his hustle t-shirts on when I shot the video, uh, and I got to meet him. And actually, he remembered me from from that email. Oh, not only that, the other thing too about giving, so there's one other thing about social media. I haven't really um, got into it yet, but it is a really big thing and it is social media influencers. Um, and so that's the idea when my work got posted on Art Fido and Art of the World and my following just went up incredibly. So there are people out there who have huge social media followings. You can pay them to have your work featured on their site. And it, it, again, so it depends on the person, depends how much, um, but that can often get huge, huge results for you. So that whole idea too, and he's a big, big advocate of kind of cold calling people. They're kind of just doing the unexpected thing without, without um, sort of expectation of return. So when that whole LinkedIn thing was going on, I was actually emailing back and forth with Andy Cranick, who's the head of the brand manager for VaynerMedia. And he actually gave me a lot of advice to kind of wade my way through that. And that ended up being a very successful thing. So when that whole kind of thing was over, I actually sent four 16 by 16 originals down to VaynerMedia. So one for Gary Vaynerchuk, one for Andy Cranick, one for, he's got two other people on his team that are, so I spent, I sent like six grand in originals down there, just said, hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate it and here's what's happened for me. And I continue to email him and he, every once in a while he gets back to me. And actually Andy Cranach, the head of the brand, he's emailed me back and forth a number of times. Um, so I can't remember what the question was, but I hope that answered it. Yes. Uh, Gary, you're talking social media here. Traditional print media, does it matter? Does it still work? So for, I haven't done that. I actually, I actually think that's one thing I probably should do. I, I, I probably should have had several articles published in International Artists by now, but I just haven't gotten around to doing it. But I also, for me, it's kind of like there's, there's reaching an audience that's all artists, and then there's reaching an audience that's potential clients, right? But I also know there's spillover, because I know that there's an, uh, probably at least 15 to 20% of the people who buy my work also paint. So, yeah. Is yeah. Oh, I did have, so that, I, I had a, last year, two years ago, I had like an 18 page spread in Arabella. That's the other, the other thing about social media though, is if you get very popular and you're out there, they'll contact you. So Arabella contacted me out of the blue and just said, we'd like to do an 18 page spread on you and your work. And I said, okay, sure. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, print media, print media is not dead, right? It's just, it's, 
if you're paying for it, it's overpriced. I remember I took an ad out on, because I'm an ex-police officer, we had an open house where we were, we were offering a discount for police officers. It cost me $900 to do a half page ad, right? Like I've spent, um, and you know, and we got very limited response, you know, a, t a $10 boost can get me 20,000 views targeted of people who I'm interested in. So it's just, if I'm gonna spend those ad dollars, I really don't wanna do it there. But the best thing you can do is if you can make something that's newsworthy or there's a story behind it and then get them to do an article on you, then that, so that's what I did with that whole LinkedIn thing. We got a lot of press. We didn't spend, the only money I spent was on the PR person. But that got me, like Canada AM, there was three and a half million people watch me that morning on TV with that painting. So that's what I would recommend, is try to be creative about to get covered in traditional media because there's some sort of a story. Because that's what social media is all about too, it's storytelling. It's telling a story and, in, a, in a way, again, in a way that's entertaining, educational, or inspiring. Yes. So I basically use all of social media to lead people to my website, and then that's where they can buy. So you can go to my website, and you can see every single G-Clay that we have available is on the website, and you can actually click and buy now on it, and we'll ship it anywhere it can in the US. So the website is still very important, at least for now. Like th this, this stuff, I just saw that uh, I boosted a post for my event, and it's like now there's the option to put a shop now button on there. And so I boot, so I, I did the create the event, boost it. Okay, I'll put a shop now button on there and I'm just gonna connect that directly to our online shop. Uh, so more and more, all of the social media platforms are trying to make it seamless so that you don't even have to leave Facebook to buy it or whatever. So that is changing. But for me, like you can see, I've got a huge amount of G clays that we have available and even originals that are available. People need a place where they can go to actually see all of them, see the pricing and all that, and then buy them. But yeah, if you just have like if you just have a website and you're relying on people finding it and going to it, that's not going to happen. The way you get people to your website is social media. Your printer makes the shape of your property before you start here. Okay, I don't want to get too much into that because there are people going to be watching. It's all about social media, but I use it. An Epson 9900, uh, and it's it's a yeah, Epson Stylus Pro 9900. It's, it's though again, everything now is changing. Technology is just it, it's like it's like blockbuster video had had the opportunity to buy Netflix and laughed at them, right? A year and a half later, I went to pick up a video and blockbuster was boarded up, right? It's just technology is just changing things so fast. So my dad was an offset lithographer. He was a head pressman at Herzog Somerville, one of the top fine art print shops in the world. And when he was doing prints, they were doing offset litho, so nowhere near the quality of what we do now. It was million dollar pieces of equipment, 15 skilled tradespeople, uh, just millions of dollars of equipment. Uh, the cost of entry now for eight to $10,000 you could be doing prints of your own work, say 24 inches wide, uh, and, yeah, and you can learn how to do it. My, I learned how to do it all myself. I taught my son Cameron, he does all our printing now. Um, it's just crazy, but just everything. It's like you know Uber, black car services, right? Hotels, Airbnb, um, everything is, is being, this is a huge radical shift. And the big thing is the gatekeepers are, are just being knocked out left, right, and center, and direct to client is more, look at Amazon. Like, Amazon is just killing retail, uh, because why would you go to a mall when you can order it from your computer and have it delivered tomorrow? You don't have to worry if it's in stock or whatever. So the whole mall business is gonna be changed. It has to, they're, they're gonna be changing, to, there has to be something about an event or some sort of thing going on to bring you to a mall, because people are not going. It's like everything is just being, it's just being kind of turned on its head. And this is a time where there's still a lot of white space out there. There's still a lot of beachfront property that's not Malibu yet, but will be Malibu in two, three, four years. Uh, so that, I'll just talk a little bit about Brooke, because we were talking about all her followers. She was here the other day. And so she's got, she's got 38,000 followers on Instagram. Uh, and she said, I would trade those for your 18,000 
Facebook followers because your followers have a lot more money and they're, buy, they're more likely to buy. And it's like, yes, for now. But those 18 to 22 year olds are gonna be getting married not too far in the distance. They're gonna be buying houses. And by that time, you're gonna have 300,000 followers. So that's the whole thing is grabbing up space now where maybe your clients aren't there right now, but they're gonna, two things, they're gonna be your clients in five to 10 years. But also every social media platform ages up and ages up rapidly. As soon as the people that, so the young people that are on it, as soon as they start having kids, because grandma and grandpa want to see the kids' pictures. That's what aged up Facebook. When all of the college kids, they got married, had kids, put all the pictures of their babies on Facebook, all of the grandparents realized, I need to get Facebook if I want to see pictures of my, my grandson. And so that's going to happen with Instagram. It's going to happen with Snapchat. Snapchat's now kind of in the kind of 10 to 15 year old. That's their big demographic. But all of these things age up and age up really quickly. So the whole idea of, you know, if you're really, really serious about social media is being kind of a first land grab in a platform that right now is maybe not where all the people with money are. So that you grab a big space there so that by the time it ages up, you've already there. You've got Malibu beachfront property by the time it becomes Malibu. Uh, Like get the money? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's actually more secure than ever because that you, so I have, I have a, on my site, we use the app called Shopify. They probably, from last I heard, it's like 40 to 50% of all e-commerce in the world is done on top of the Shopify app. So for people that want to make a purchase, it's PayPal or their credit card. And it's vetted through Shopify. Like it is, it is much, much safer than someone writing you a check or even someone coming in the old day and you doing the click clack on the, on the internet, or sorry, on, the, on their credit card. It's very, very safe. Now, is there a chance you could get stiff? Sure, I've never, never been stiff. Um, and again, when you're going through one of these big platforms, it's so easy. I will just mention though, because I, I did a video on this, there are people out there who are specifically targeting artists and trying to defraud you. So you will get, I get probably once every couple weeks, I'll get an email and it just says, oh, oh, I love your work, would like to order some, please send me a list of available pieces and I will, I will buy them and I will pay by certified check or whatever. And what they're trying to do, um, or they say, I have a shipper who will ship it and will come pick it up at your house or whatever. So they're trying to, in many cases, they don't even care about the artwork they're going to defraud you of money on the back end. So they're going to have their shipper come to your door, pick up your artwork. You're going to pay him $400 for shipping. And he's just going to go throw that artwork in the dumpster and he's got his $400, right? Or they'll say, they'll pay you with a certified check and there'll be a mistake that the piece of art is $2,000 and they sent you a check for $3,000. That's okay. Just send me, send me a, a, an e-transfer back for the $1,000, right? So that's how you're likely to get defrauded. But that's not people coming to you on your site going through your platform where you've set it up. That's people contacting you by email saying, oh, I wanna buy this piece. So the things, the things that to look out for for that, the number one is they're not even asking about a specific piece. They're just saying, I will buy your art. Well, people don't buy art like it's a bushel of apples, right? They, they fall in love with a piece and buy the piece. So that's the one thing. The other thing is if they specify to you how they're gonna pay, because that means they have access to this, whether it's certified check or you may get them saying, I'll pay you by credit card with the valid uh, expiry date and the CCV number on the back. Well, they're saying that because they've, got, they've somehow got access to these, right? Um, and then the other one is they make up these elaborate stories that just really don't make sense. They're moving, that happens a lot. They're in the process of moving, so their, oh, their shipper will handle it. So if you got those three things, and then you just say, I always just say, the only thing I'll do for inner, so, we ship to the US just via our Shopify store and we ship to England uh, because we've, we've done a lot of business there. But if, if it's going like way around the world or all, a, a bank draft is the only way. If you do a bank draft uh, where they actually wire money from their bank account to your bank account, that is the only foolproof way. So if in doubt, you just say to them, I'll need a bank draft and then that's the last you hear of them. Yeah. Sorry? E-transfer works too. E-transfer works. Um, is there a limit on that now, though? Is that, or is it? I don't know. 
It, at one point it was 2,000, but uh, yeah, e-transfer works good. But like, buy, like selling your stuff on the internet now is so, so secure compared to all the stuff. We, you have people showing up at an art festival and writing you a check, right? Like, how do you know? I will say though, I've never ever been stiffed for a piece of artwork. Um, when I first started doing the festivals, Shell Orling, uh, an artist, a member of the Canadian Watercolor Society, was really good at this and took me under his wing. And he, and he told me, he said, like, if you'll get people who are out walking their dog or out for a run, and it's like, oh, there's an art festival. And they'll stop and they'll see your work and they'll fall in love with it and they'll want to buy a piece, but they won't have any money, they won't have any ID on them, whatever. Um, and he says, what I do, I, I get their name, get their, uh, hopefully they have some ID, but I'll, you know, you can quiz them a few times to make sure the information that they're not, they're not kind of stiffing yet and say, here, you can take it now and you can send me a check. Um, and he said at that point he'd done that 10 or 15 times, no one had ever stiffed him. There was a couple times where he had to make a phone call um, and then once where he had to send a registered letter and people just forgot. But people aren't generally out there, especially like at art festivals. Like I be, I'm concerned, I get targeted a lot, people trying to problem me because my work has value, they can turn it around and sell it. But like when I was doing the art festivals and my pieces were selling for 300, 500, 600 dollars, like the criminals are not out targeting artists for their 500 dollars, 600 dollars painting. So, yes? Yes. And So I was, yes, it, so I was a high realism portrait painter. So when I left the Toronto Police Force, I was uh, an elected member of the Canadian Watercolor Society based on my figurative watercolors. I was a senior signature member of the Canadian Institute of Portrait Artists, so total high realism portrait painter. Uh, two years in to painting hundreds of paintings of other people's kids, fathers, mothers, wives, the way they wanted me to paint them where like John Singer Sargent said it best, a portrait is a likeness with something wrong with the nose. Uh, you know, can you fix this? I thought after two years, like, what have I done? I had a job I really liked. I hate going into the studio. Um, and okay, how, how long have we been going? Can't tell. Okay, I'm gonna tell a quick story. I'm gonna talk a little bit about art now because most of you here are, are artists. Um, so at this time, when I realized this had happened, what I really wanted to do was paint landscapes. Uh, but I wasn't very good at them. Um, and I would paint landscapes for my studio open house, and so I would make most of my money on my portraits. My portraits, when I, my, when I was finally doing portraits, the last one I did, I got $5,000 for a portrait. I would charge $400 for a landscape, the same size. Um, and I talked to a bunch of my artist friends. This is when I was, I might actually have been president at that time of the Canadian Watercolor Society. And I talked to a number of my friends and kind of said, you know what, I've just, I've just resigned myself to the fact that portraits are what I'm really good at. And if I'm gonna make a name for myself, it's gonna be based on my portraits. And if I'm gonna make a decent living, it's gonna have to be with my portraits. And I actually said this to about three or four people and they said, that makes sense, Tim. Yeah, I think that's right. Do the, port do the landscapes for fun. And it's like, yeah, people will buy them because they go with the couch, but stick with what you're really good. That's what got you here, right? And so, any of you know Neville Clark? He's uh, probably Canada's most famous black artist, one of the best figurative watercolor painters uh, in the world. Neville was president of the Watercolor Society before me, and he was on the, we were on the board together for 10 years, and we used to travel back and forth to board meetings. Um, and I lived in Whitby, and he lived in Pickering, so I'd pick him up and we'd go in. And so there was one memorable uh, day, we were coming home from, uh, from a board meeting, and I was driving around the 401, and so I said this to Neville. I said, yeah, I've just resigned myself to that. I really want to paint landscapes, but I've just resigned myself to the fact that no one's ever going to buy my landscapes. You know, I suck at landscapes. They're going to buy my portraits, and I'll just do that. And there was dead silence, and I could, like, almost feel the temperature drop in the car. And Neville is one of the most mild-mannered, nicest men I would ever, I've ever met. That's how anyone would describe him. And so there's this silence and I look over and he is staring at me with this look of utter contempt. Uh, and I'm like, what? And he said, excuse my language, but that's the only time I ever heard Neville say this. He said, Tim, I'm fucking disgusted with you. And I'm like, what, what did I do? He said, I can't believe those words came out of your mouth. He said, I had great respect for you as an artist, 
um, and your integrity as an artist, but I can't, he said, what made you think you should be able to just move from painting portraits to painting landscapes? He said, I know everything you've put into painting portraits. You've done none of that in landscapes. He said, if you want to paint landscapes, paint landscapes. But it's not going to be easy. It might take you two years, three years, five years. You need to sweat blood to go after what you want to do. Uh, and that's what I did. That, that was one of those four conversations I've had in my life that changed my life. I'm actually getting choked up just thinking about it. Because if I'd never had that conversation, I would be painting portraits and hating it. And people would be buying my landscapes because they go with the couch. Um, so that's sort of answering that. And in terms of the success of my work with, with this, yes. Um, the key to, to having a successful career as an artist is to be, and it's the same as in music. So do you, if you think, it's creating great work with a unique voice, right? You can create great work that looks a lot like hundreds or thousands of other artists. Pretty difficult to make a living. If any of you are watching The Voice or American Idol, there's all kinds of singers on there, technically perfect, but they fit a type that there's thousands of them all sound that way. Then you have someone like Rod Stewart, right? You have someone like Ed Sheeran, technically not as, not as good as the others, but they create great work with a unique voice. If you like Ed Sheeran's work, there's only one guy doing that, right? And so that's the whole thing, is creating great work with a unique voice. And this style has become my hallmark. I have, I, I loved it. I was uh, hanging a show at a gallery down in Yorkville a couple of years ago, I guess we were hanging the show and these ladies walked in and the one lady said, oh, I know this guy, I've seen his work at Deerhurst. Like, she didn't know who I was. She didn't need to know the signature. She just knew I've seen, I've seen this type of work before and this has to be the guy that does it. And so that's what it is. It doesn't matter what it is, it's gotta be, my belief is it's gotta be great. So it's gotta be, technically great, so all of the technical skills have to be showing at the highest level. It's got to be um, compositionally great in terms of the way it moves the viewer's eye through the painting and engages them. It has to evoke emotional response in the viewer, and then it has to be unique, where people can see your work one place and then see it. I had a girl come to our show in Toronto this summer. She said, I saw a piece of yours in a Yorkville gallery four years ago. I was walking by at night and I saw it in the window and then she saw my Facebook event that we were having and she said, that's got to be the guy. So that's, that's what you need. I haven't, doc I, sh I shouldn't say, I have documented um, the whole progress. Unfortunately, a lot of them are on floppy disks uh, and three and a half inch disks, you know, and old computers. That, like, so there's a whole period of, of my production where I really don't have half decent images or any images of it because all of that technology now is gone. But I went digital really early. I wish I'd have stayed a little longer on the traditional photography. Yes? I paint, I paint basically, that's a really good question. Because if, if you're an artist, you'll find that there's, there's a window where you're on, right? For me, that's between 11 o'clock and five o'clock every day. And nothing gets in the way of that. So that's my painting time. I do everything else before, I do everything else after. I try to paint every day. It probably works out on average, some weeks five days a week, some weeks six days a week. Um, but I can only go four or five hours and I'm exhausted. Um, you, you always tell people who don't paint, right? Because they say, oh, you paint all day, that must be so relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of, it's challenging, it's rewarding, it's frustrating, but it's not relaxing, it's draining. Um, but yeah, and, and, and like I say, I miss sometimes, I was doing really good five years ago, just painting five days a week and sending the stuff out to galleries. But I realized, like I'm still a young guy, so I, I have my son Cameron works for me full time. So when we decided he was gonna do that, that also put an extra kind of responsibility on me to create a business that's going to be self-sustaining, not so that if I decide in five years I'm gonna back off and stop painting, he's not gonna be there like, what do I do, right? So my goal now is to just continue to increase the business uh, to the point where I expect my great grandkids are gonna go to university on, on the money being made of my prints that are still selling. So I'm, I'm just so super excited, that's, that's why. Yeah? How many paintings do you produce? About 100. Yeah. So I can do uh, an 18 by 18 is like one session five hours painting. On a really good day, I can do a 24 by 24. 
that three by three that's finished there that actually I'm loving it on, on Facebook. It's getting a lot of people saying that have followed me for years. That's their favorite I've ever done. That's only about 11 or 12 hours of work. So I'm really fast. But I think part of that too is because I was a watercolor painter uh, and painting at the highest level, painting portraits in watercolor. So you learn really quickly to put the right brush stroke in the right place or the right color, the right value. So I don't come back in and do a lot of correcting. I paint very directly in the painting. Let's go fairly quick. So you just go on YouTube, you go to my YouTube channel. So that's it. So it's youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Tim Packer Fine Arts. Or you can just go to my website, which is timpacker.com. If you scroll to the bottom of any page, there's links to all of my social media. So you just, the one that's, I even I found it. I said, Cameron, where's our YouTube? It's like it's there. It's just a little play button uh, in a circle. You click on that and it'll take you there. Just type, yeah, just type my name into, into Google. Uh, you'll get a few pages back <laughs> until, you, until you get to, this, to the, there's a guy in England who's a soccer player or something. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the embellished uh, today. Yeah. What's so this is So this is a G-clay. It's, it's printed on canvas, but there's no texture to it, right? And so these usually go for about somewhere around 20%, 18 to 20% of what an original would go for. But a lot of people, they, they like the look of an original with the texture, and they want the texture, but they can't afford an original. And so hand embellishing is where the artist takes uh, thick bodied, uh, the heavy bodied acrylic paints, and you actually mix them then with the modeling paste, and come over and paint over top of the G clay in acrylics with really heavy texture. And then it actually looks like an original. Uh, and then that, that, they go for about double, uh, because that, that takes my time. So there are actually, you got to be really careful with stuff like this. So if you buy a hand embellished print from one of the big publishers, I can almost guarantee you they've got a whole team of uh, art students who are hand embellishing the prints. So it's not touched by that artist. It's just adding texture. Any of mine, I actually do. So they're getting a, they're getting a print, but it's actually been worked on by me for five or six hours to add the texture. I noticed the double signature. Is that print on this one here? Yep. So the, the, the one signature is the actual signature that appears on the painting, and then the other one is the signed, the number and sign for the limited edition. Yeah. Well, limited are in addition. Hmm? Well, are These ones we do 100. Yeah. Um, some of the small paper prints we do 250 or 500, and then we actually just started doing open editions. So that whole back wall down there is all open editions. Um, again, because there's gonna come a time when I'm not here to sign them anymore, and I don't want the whole business to grind to a halt. So these are not limited? These are limited. All of these are limited to 100. There's not a double signature at all? Yeah, there is. There is. I don't like having to sign them because it's like when I finish, the composition is done. Now I, when you add a signature, it's just like adding another couple branches. It doesn't need that there. So I often try to make it very inobtrusive. But with the snow pieces, there's no, like there's, yeah, there's no place to put it where you can't see it. So there's a signature on every one of these numbers. Gary V. Yes. Are they very detailed in how to go about the, the, the best one that I found was, now mind you, everything changes, right? Because in his, one of his comments and one of them is, Johnny, nobody wants to watch your 10 minute Facebook video. And that was true a year and a half ago. I've got hour long videos out there that get tons of views. So this stuff's all changing so quick. But the best one that I found was Jab, 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 Right Hook, where he talks about the individual platforms, shows examples of posts that were good, shows examples of where the people fell down with it. Um, but I, I, just, I just watch all of his videos. If you watch one of his keynotes, you know, you'll learn so much. He's got, he's got the Ask Gary V show, there's like 300 episodes. It's like this Q&A, and each episode's like half an hour, 45 minutes, where people text him in or call in with questions about social media. So if you watch the last 15 Ask Gary V's, everything that he said is right, right now. If you watch episode one from two years ago, that may have changed since then. Do you see that as approaching your YouTube channel? Not my YouTube, but my Facebook. I've actually had about four ad agencies approach me that they want to pay me like $1,500 a month to have access to my ad manager so that they can put ads out and it's not even going to appear under my, under my Facebook. 
It'll appear separate, but they're taking advantage of the reach that I have. But I don't want to do that because I, I don't want to risk. I've worked really hard to get this, right? Well, and Facebook can, I'm, I'm not sure if Facebook wants, so I've just said no. Um, and I, and I, my decision I made a while ago, I had a conversation with uh, a couple at, at a show I was at, and so they'd actually, they had a couple of really big originals of mine, um, and very well-to-do couple, and they were, I was telling them about my YouTube channel and, the, and how I was giving it all away and all that. Um, and the husband was like, so are you monetizing this? And I said, no, I've decided, you know, I said, I've decided I don't want to make my money off the backs of aspiring artists. That I want to make my money off the backs of people like you. And that came out of my mouth before I even <laughs> thought, right? And I thought, uh-oh. And anyways, they both laughed and went, damn right, we've got the money, we can afford it. So that really is, I'm not at all interested in monetizing the traffic to my site. I'm just interested in increasing the awareness of my work and the brand and having confidence that that will result in business down the road and in sharing the message, sharing everything that, like, I didn't get here in a vacuum and living this life that, that's a dream. There were an awful lot of people who gave me of their time, their expertise, and gave it willingly. And so I really feel a debt. And now that I have the ability, I, I felt really guilty for a number of years when I had to quit teaching because I just, when I did the math, it's like it's costing me too much money to take a day away from painting to go teach a workshop to 10 or 15 or 20 people. But when YouTube came along, it's like perfect. I can actually do a better job of teaching a lesson and then put it out there and it's out there forever and it's out there for free. I got time, time for one last story I'm gonna tell you about the power of social media um, and, and how, just how crazy it is uh, that goes towards this. So on LinkedIn, when I had this thing going crazy on LinkedIn, I got a message from a girl in Africa and lived, I'm not sure where she lived, like in the middle of Africa in a small village um, and she loved art, loved to paint, um, but there was no instruction and she wanted to know, like, do you have any suggestions? And it's like, you are who I created my YouTube channel for. So I gave her the info for my YouTube channel, and she would message me back and forth over the course of about a five or six month period. And then I get a direct message from her with a photo. There's a picture of her with two paintings. And she's like, Tim, I'm so excited. I just sold my first two paintings. And I got, like, I got teared up. The hair's going up on the back of my neck. And, I, and that's how powerful this is. It's like you have the ability to reach and impact people around the world um, and doing a good thing as well as growing your business, growing your brand, kind of giving you the freedom to do what you want to do for a living. So I think, how long have we gone there? An hour and 20 minutes. Well, I hope you enjoyed that talk. Uh, I hope you found it entertaining, inspiring, and a little educational. Um, but there were a couple things that uh, we touched on after the camera shut off uh, with some Q&As, and I thought it's really important that I add those things. So the one thing in particular, I did not go uh, into any detail in the actual specifics of like the mechanics of how do you create a Facebook page, how do you upload a video to Facebook or YouTube, how do you shoot video on your phone? How do you edit video? All of the kind of how-to things. And there's a very specific reason for that, that there's a great place to go to find out how to do all of that technical stuff, and it's Google. Um, you can literally Google, how do I do anything uh, on your computer? And you will get back a ton of responses. You'll get videos showing you specifically how to do any of these things. You'll get written posts showing you. So for any of the specific things that you want to do, for example, if you don't even have an Instagram account, then just Google, how do I get an Instagram account? And you will get back videos that will show you exactly how to do all that. So that's why I didn't get into, into any of the actual technical stuff of how to. The other thing that I didn't really mention um, is consistency is so, so important. So you cannot, um, you know, do three posts this week and then go a month and then do another post the next week and then post every day for two weeks and then not post. Um, you need to be posting, if we're talking about on Instagram and Facebook um, and LinkedIn, you know, just about every day. 
Uh, for YouTube, if you're creating video, obviously it's much tougher to create video content. Now I did a daily vlog, uh, and that was a lot of work, but even with YouTube, um, ideally you want to at least let people know how often they can expect to see your videos and when they can expect to see them. So for example, a lot of people say, well, they'll post a new video every Monday by noon, and then they do one video a week, or if it's one video a month, whatever it is, it is just important to let your viewers know when they can expect to see the next post coming up. So that's it for now. Um, I thank you for spending this time with me. I'm Tim Packer. If you want to see more of my videos, now most of them are about art and the business of being an artist, then you can go to my YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Tim Packer Fine Arts. Um, and if you want to really dive deep into social media, I can't recommend enough uh, following Gary V and all of his content, uh, reading his books, uh, because that's what's got me from just several hundred followers to now where I'm approaching 30,000, and it's driving an incredible amount of business to me. So again, thanks for your time. I'm Tim Packer.